started. Uh, so as I just said, uh, the class today, since it's a short class, 50 minutes, uh, I will not get all the way through this class uh, so that tomorrow I can finish this class and then get into a bit of preparation for your midterm, which is on Thursday, to go over all of the materials that questions will come from. Uh, today, <coughs> I want to remind you also a little bit of what we saw so far in terms of thermal machining techniques. The uh, techniques we are considering in class 5 for thermal energy-based machining. And we had already quite some insight in sinker electrical discharge machining, EDM, and wire EDM. But I'll just go back over the highlights to get you back into the thinking of how these thermal energy uh, based removing techniques work. Uh, then we get onto laser beam machining. And what I will do is I will start on laser beam machining, but also remind you on what a laser is, how it actually works. Because quite a few of you might have forgotten uh, how a laser actually functions. And then uh, tomorrow I will finish electron beam machining and plasma arc cutting because these are rather short sections. So first, to remind you a bit of EDM, you also know in the homework there's a question on EDM, right? The question really is, why doesn't the tool corrode or, or, or get consumed faster than the workpiece? Why is it asymmetric, right? In a way, your homework has two questions in the same way. You know, ultrasonic machining and EDM. Why in both of these cases is it is it asymmetric? Why is the workpiece being machined faster than the work tool itself? Right? So, in all of these thermal removing processes, you remember thermal energy provided by a heat source melts and or evaporizes, vaporizes, I should say, the volume of the material to be removed. And so let's get into this ADM to get to the point where we have stopped in last class. Also, I want to draw your attention again to Something quite critical, we will see that in almost all thermal remo removing techniques, you have this so-called heat affected zone, HAZ. But today we will actually learn that there's some exceptions. We will see that with very fast laser machining, you can avoid that HAZ. Most laser machining today will have dramatic problems with the heat affected zone. But just about 10 years ago, it was discovered that with femtosecond lasers, so lasers are pulsed very, very, very fast, you can avoid that heat affected zone. And that's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn how a laser works, and then how this HAZ, in the case of laser machine, can be avoided actually by using femtosecond lasers. But still, to kind of remind you of where we were, I'm not going to run this video again on EDM, you saw that, but the first type of EDM or electric discharge machining we saw was this so-called sinker EDM, where basically you have a tool that's the opposite in shape of the one you want to make in your workpiece. And you remember we apply these uh, high voltage sparks between the workpiece and the tool, and the sparks principally corrode, melt the material of the workpiece away. And the uh, medium here, the dielectric fluid, carries away that molten matter. Here is the setup. Workpiece in this case doesn't need to be certain type of kind of workpieces can be used, or kind of materials. Can I use an insulator here? Must be conductor, right? You have a main constraint there in that regard. What about ultrasonic machining? What are kind of the limitations there on the material? If you contrast these two, EDM works for conductive materials, right? Mm -hmm. And ultrasonic machining or USM can work on any, any material. Is that true? Uh, for example, a soft material, you wouldn't use it, right? Hard, brittle materials especially. Here, these are all the functions of this uh, dielectric fluid in EDM. What can be uh, these dielectric fluids? What kind of substances can they be? So they are either oil or DI water. 
mostly they cannot be conducted. Uh, by the way, I want to draw your attention here that if I replace that dielectric liquid here in that little gap, if I replace this fluid by a conductor, you actually have a setup that's more like electrochemical machining, and that's one of the next classes. So remember that. If I, all I really need to do, in a way, is change that medium. If I make it a very good conductor, you can't spark anymore. You won't get that breakdown. And that's a big difference between these two. ECM or electrical machine, electrochemical machine or EDM. Big difference is the medium. Insulator, uh, like a, an oil or water, DI water, or an electrolyte that's very conductive. We also saw that with this EDM, still, still simple EDM, but if you control uh, the tool with the CNC machine, you can of course make more complex shapes. And we see some examples of that here. So that would then be called CNC uh, plunger EDM or sinker EDM. Plunger, sinker, etc., all the same words. And here I have given you a little bit of uh, an overview of what all is involved in electro discharge machine. So in this case, we are still dealing with you make the tool and then you machine in your workpiece the negative of that tool. And when that tool becomes very small, for example here, we talk about micro EDM. So you already saw something about lithography. We know with lithography we can make shapes that are very small. Now suppose that I make a little hole with photolithography and I electroplate nickel in that hole. I can make a damn sharp small EDM too. That's what we call micro EDM. That's where these two fields could come together. Uh, the tool you fabricate with lithography so you can make much smaller EDM shapes. Uh, what, what is the cutoff again between lithography and mechanical machining? So if I make my tool with mechanical machining for EDM versus lithography, where would you roughly say the cutoff is in size? 100 microns. About 100 microns, right? That's a good number to have in your head. Now here, big transition. We are moving from single EDM to wire EDM. Now, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. If I use a wire, I can move that wire in any possible shape I desire. In other words, I don't need to make a tool up front. That's a big help, right, for industry. You have either all the work involved in making a specific tool for a certain task, or you use a wire, wire EDM. Not just like think about cutting through cheese with a wire, <laughs> kind of like this. So here you see an example. We have this wire uh, being fed from the supply reel to the takeoff reel, and it feeds through the workpiece. Of course, you still need to supply around the wire that dielectric. And you still need to apply that big voltage between the wire and your workpiece, just like before. Except now, you have this wire that does the cutting. And with CNC machining, machine, you can bring the heat of your wire in any direction you want. X, Y, Z, or give it a tilt, it doesn't matter. So you can pretty much cut out any shape you want. So that was a big, big advantage when this wire EDM was discovered. You see it? Same kind of drawing here. All of these shapes were made with EDM wire cutting. Here you see that sometimes you want to first drill a hole in an object, then feed that wire through the hole, and then you can start making these shapes. Right? Otherwise, it would be difficult to get to a shape like that, right? So you drill the hole, feed the wire, now the wire can start cutting and make these complicated shapes you see on the right. So I think this is about where we were, isn't it? I think that was the last slide. And so let's pick up from here. 
This is also by EDM, except it's maybe the most sophisticated, sophisticated uh, embodiment of it. Uh, you have a wire receiving spool like before and a wire giving spool. And then the cutting action is right here in this little part. Now this block can move in any direction. So it can be pushed forward, down, left, right, and even cutting at angles. By doing that, that wire now can make shapes as sophisticated as you can see here. And in this case, a, a small pagoda was machined out. And you can see now we are getting into the micro domain. With uh, more traditional EDM, you couldn't do it. With micro EDM, you could make a similar structure. We're making a pagoda here that's about 1.25 millimeters by 1.75 millimeters. So that is quite the state of the art. Uh, in industry, you will not find that capability yet. This, this is more in the research phase. So with that, we are switching now to laser beam machining. And that's your second thermal energy-based machining process we're going to analyze. And so I have to get you a little bit into understanding how a laser works before we can kind of understand uh, what's happening here. But before we explain a laser operation, first of all, what does the word stand for? So it's for, it stands for, the L comes from light, A from amplification, S from stimulated, E from emission, and R from radiation. So from there, the word laser. And what each of these terms means, we'll see in a moment. Right. So, Machining with laser beams was introduced uh, actually not all that long ago, in the early 70s. And now it's used in many, many, many industries. Uh, when you see lasers, you will see all kind of uh, acronyms. You will often see a laser and in front of it you will see CW. That means it's a continuous uh, laser. It means the light uh, is not pulsed, it continuously uh, comes out of the laser. If it's pulse, you'll see a P in front of the laser type. Uh, we have uh, liquid lasers, solid lasers, and gas lasers. Uh, the, depending on the medium of the lasing action, it can be in, in a gas, in a solid or a liquid. We'll see in a moment what is the key to being able to do lasing. Now, where is it all used? Look at that. This is a tremendous list of application. You know, truly could say that laser machining has become a very, very important machining tool, especially we will see after the discovery of femtosecond lasers. I'm making a big deal out of that because before laser machining was interesting, it was used a lot, but nowadays with femtosecond laser machining, we really think there will be a breakthrough in using it yet much, 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 much more. Because that heat affected zone is not observed when you use that femtosecond laser. And what the difference is, we'll see in a moment. Uh, but in any event, so here are the type of things one does with lasers. You do heat treatment, of course, welding, we all know that. Uh, ablation or cutting of plastics, glasses, ceramics, semiconductors, and metals. This technique is not only subtractive, it can also be additive. So you can also deposit materials. Laser deposition uh, of materials is an important trend. We we'll also see a very special kind of technique where you do etching with a laser, but you have a chemical assist. Uh, what that means is, before that ultra-fast laser machining, if you use a slower laser, the laser will, let's say, cut into this metal sheet here, but you will get some of the debris redeposited next to the carve. Now, how we can get rid of that debris is by feeding a little bit of reactive gas that eats away that debris, and that is called lace. So laser assisted chemical etching or lace, I'll come back to that in a bit. You could say with lace, traditional lasers can be almost as good as femtosecond lasers. Other techniques that are based on lasers, uh, laser enhanced jet plating and etching. So you, you might have a, your metal plate in a solution and if you have a a laser hitting uh, the metal, you can actually 
bring the liquid in there in a jet. So let's say that I have a laser here and I want to cut uh, the wall. You could actually have a beam of water and you use the beam of, of water as a laser guide. So the laser penetrates the beam, works into the beam, and then lasers etches the wall. Or if in the solution I'm feeding, there's a metal solution, I can actually deposit very, very, very fast metal this way. Very interesting new machining techniques. We, of course, know we can do lithography. And the latest, best lithography machines are actually using lasers, laser light. Surgery is being done. And photopolymerization, you know, in your work at Rapid Tech, a lot of the polymerization of the polymers there is done with a movable laser. So you can see there's a host of techniques that are based on lasers, all type of lasers. You see a schematic uh, illustration here of how you typically would uh, machine something. We have a laser uh, on top there with a big power supply and there is your workpiece. Laser is, uh, light is focused onto the workpiece. And here, a big advantage is that pretty much any materials, conductive, non-conductive, transparent, non-transparent, soft, hard, it can all be machined with laser. Problem so far has been the cost. These things typically, especially the femtosecond laser, still cost an arm and a leg. And as that comes down, you know, we have a chance uh, of bringing manufacturing with lasers more across the board in small companies as well as large companies. Uh, here are a, a few examples of uh, the type of lasers. So for cutting metals, plastics and ceramics. So you have PCO2. What does that mean now, PCO2? So P stands for, remember? It's pulsing in this case, right? And CO2 means it's a gas phase laser, right? And this, as I told you, depending on the medium that does the lasing, you will have gas phase, you will have liquid and solid. Uh, for drilling metals and plastic, again, PCO2, or uh, a neodymium jack, which stands for, if you pronounce the whole thing, neodymium is the ND, then the YAG is uh, yttrium aluminum garnet, a very popular laser. And then here you see CW CO2, so that's a continuous uh, laser. So you can, depending on your application that you have, choose your laser. Now I've said enough about lasers, let's now go back to the end of the notes in the class and explain how a laser works. So remember what it stands for, laser? Right, so if you understand each of these words, you actually understand how laser functions. So let's look at that. So go all the way to the back of the class notes. Here we go. So there's only four slides here and they describe without any mat uh, how the laser works. And that I want both the graduates and undergraduates to know. But there's a section in this class that describes how narrow a beam you can make with a laser. In other words, it describes the optics in terms of depth of focus and resolution. And you've seen these equations, by the way, in photolithography. But with the laser, it's slightly different. So Undergraduates do not need to know these equations, but graduates do. They need to go over it. But I, I, I'll guide you through it. So what is a laser? Again, the word laser is an acronym that stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So somehow we have a system that allows light to go in and it comes out much stronger at the end of the pipe, right? How does that work? So it actually, the word lasing represents the physical principle, but nowadays it's actually used to describe the machine, right? But lasing, if you understand each of the words, you actually know how a laser works. So here are the main components on the right. You have a mirror 
on the left here, you have another mirror on the right. That mirror here is non-transparent, but this one is semi-transparent. And you have your active medium. The active medium, as I told you, can be gas, can be liquid or solid. You also have something that does pumping. Okay, and this pumping can be a chemical energy, can be light energy, can even be nuclear energy. Now, how does this all work, right? We don't understand anything yet so far. But what eventually will happen, we will have light coming out on this side here on the right, where the mirror is semi-transparent. But first, I need to have a medium in there that allows me to create an amplification scheme. Now, how that works, we'll see in the next slide. So, so far, every laser on Earth, continuous, pulsed, uh, solid, liquid or gas, it has these components. One mirror that's completely non-transparent, one that's semi-transparent, an active medium, and a pumping system. Next slides, we're going to detail what each of those are. Oh, by the way, another name for that tube, and that can be anywhere from this length, 10 centimeters, can be meter. It's also called an optical resonator, because basically what you're going to be doing is having light going back and forth between these two walls. And that distance is important, by the way, because it will train light to go in unison back and forth between these two walls. We want to have the light walk together in the same step, in phase coherent. So what we are doing next is looking into the middle here in this part. We are looking at what's the role of this active medium? What does it really need to do? And as I told you, it can, can be liquid, solid or gas. What you have to have in that active medium or molecules, atoms, and all molecules, all atoms basically can do this, right? You have energy levels at the low level, and then you have energy levels at the high level. Now, when I shine light on a system like this, let's say I have electrons in these lower levels, I can pump them, if I have enough energy, I can pump these electrons from the lower level to the higher level. Who remembers what equation dominates this transition? There's a very simple equation that will tell you the relation between the photon energy and this en energy transition, or the, the wavelength of the light. Do you know? What, what is that equation? So I want to relate the energy involved, let's say, from this level here, the highest uh, of the lower band, to the bottom of the top energy levels. That has a certain E, right? A certain energy. Now, how do you connect that to the wavelength of the light that's able to, say, bring that electron from this level to that one, to the bottom of the top set? I'd like you to know that number, that equation. E equals, and it has two symbols. Ta -dum, ta -dum. <laughs> you know it? Very good, right. So E equals H, and H is what? Planck constant multiplied by nu, right? Which is the frequency, which is equal to lambda over C. Right? Can you write that down, or do you have it in your brain? It's a very simple equation, right? E equals H nu. Nu is the frequency of the light. You can see. If E equals H nu, when the frequency goes up, what does that mean? Lower energy or, hi or higher energy? That's an easy one. <laughs> higher energy, right? Am I then going from the blue light to the red light or vice versa? Higher energy light in terms of wavelength, how does that go? It's going to be the inverse, right? In other words, long wavelength has lower energy, right? Red, and then I'm going to the blue. Shorter wavelength, higher frequency, higher energy, right? So that's the connection. The light I'm pumping in here 
to excite electrons from here to here, they need to have an energy, obviously that's sufficient, to make that transition. And it's given by that simple equation. So please, for those who didn't know the answer to that question, write that down and check it out, what the equation is all about. E equals H nu, with H the Planck constant and nu the frequency of the light involved. So let's read uh, what we have here on the left. The laser active medium, laser light is generated in the active medium of the laser. So this system somehow will allow us to get laser light out of it. Now what are the rules? When will that start happening? When will we have laser light emerging? Well, energy is pumped into the active medium. That's why we call this thing the pump, right? So going back to this slide. The pump here pumps energy in somehow. So realize it doesn't need to be photon energy. I told you that already. It could be chemical energy. It could be nuclear energy. It just needs to be able to make that transition of lower energy states to higher energy states, right? Pumping. That's where an active medium is able to get a lot of electrons from the lower energy states to the higher energy states. So energy is pumped into the active medium in an appropriate form and is partially transformed into radiation energy. So now that's important. No matter how I do the pumping, electrons that will fall back, that's this arrow, cause a photon. Well, you know that, right? Remember that? If an electron falls back, let's say from that level to this one, the red arrow, is a photon. Now what's the energy, what is the wavelength of that photon? What equation do I use here? Same, Same right? And what will have the longer wavelength, you think? This one or this one? I want to see if you understood where we are so far. We'll have the longer wavelength, very good, right? You put in a much higher energy, you can see that, right? Also the green arrow is longer than the red one. You lose energy. How do you lose that energy, by the way? Do people remember that? Could be through vibration, right? Anything that absorbs phonons will subtract from the energy of the photon, and the photon will have a lower energy, thus a longer wavelength. So the energy pumped into the active medium is usually highly entropic. Okay, that's a word, a mouthful. I say a wordful. <laughs> what does that mean? Highly entropic. What is highly entropic? Very random. It means what comes in, the pump, can feed it any kind of photon. It can come from left, right. It can have any phase, any color. Entropic. It's random. And we know what needs to happen. We need to go from that randomness to something that's very organized. We want all these photons to walk like soldiers in phase. So, usually highly entropic, very disorganized, while the resulting laser radiation is highly ordered and thus has lower entropy. So more order is lower entropy. Right? So highly entropic energy is therefore converted into less entropic energy within the laser. So let's go to the next slide. Have you understood this? So all we need to retain from the second, first, first slide, we retain what the laser is comprised of. Pump, active medium, and these two mirrors, the resonator cave, uh, cavity. Here, what we need to understand is how the pump works and how I promote electrons at a lower level to a higher level and how that creates photons, uh, the red line. Now the next slide kind of starts pulling things together. We're going to consider now just kind of the same molecule, liquid, gas, or solid, and I'm looking at bringing electrons from this level, lower level, to E1 and E2. Now, if I have a normal thermal equilibrium, we know that electrons will distribute such that fewer will be on the higher level and much more will be on the lower level. That feels comfortable, right? You always will want to fall down to a lower level, lower energy. So the left picture does not sketch 
the laser operation. The next picture on the right is the one. You need to create a situation through pumping so hard and so fast that you have more electrons at the higher energy level than the lower one. That point is called inversion. I want that to sink into your mind. It's a very important point because you will have no lasing action until, until this inversion happens. And I'm going to try to explain why that is. If you understand why that is, you understand how a laser works. Hmm? So a moment ago we saw a pump brings electrons up from the lower, le lower level to the higher level. But if thermal energy is sufficient and you wait long enough, it will always go back to the left side. No lasing. To cause lasing, you need to be in this situation. Now, I'm going to try to understand in this slide and the next one why we need inversion for a laser to work. So again, inversion is the situation, an unnatural situation, where you have more electrons at a higher energy level than a lower energy level. So what is inversion? The laser transition of an active medium occurs between uh, two defined levels or level groups, the upper E2 and the lower E1. Important in terms of laser operation is that an inverted condition is achieved between the two energy levels. The higher energy level must be more densely populated than the lower. Nothing more than what I already told you. Second bullet point, inversion is never achieved in systems that are thermodynamically in equilibrium. You understand that too, right? The high ones want to fall down. So thermal equilibrium is thus characterized by the fact that lower energy level is always more densely populated than the higher. Lasers must therefore operate in the opposite condition uh, in which than the one that prevails in in the thermal condition. Now, you might still say, okay, that's, you're nice talking about this. Why? Why do I need to reach that condition? And that will become apparent, I hope, from this next slide. So, this idea of having high entropic situation, let's say on the left, photons going off in any direction to a very organized low entropy situation laser, is what we want to achieve. Now, look, I have again, just like from the previous slide, an E1 and an E2. I have these two energy levels. So now an incident photon comes in, and that incident photon happens to strike at the moment when this atom, sorry, this electron in the excited state of the atom falls down. What will happen when this thing falls down? Tell me. A photon. But I have another photon. If that happens at the same time, what do I have? I have two photons in phase. Hmm? Now try to connect this picture to the need of inversion. And you understand how a laser works. Look, if I shine light in here, and that light is absorbed by kicking electrons from this level to this one, I can't have any lasing because my energy absorbed in absorption. What I need to have is I have to have more electrons falling down than electrons that are being kicked up. That's inversion. And only in inversion, in other words, I have enough of these falling down, more of these falling down than guys going up. Then I can have enough photons being amplified by at the same time when this electron comes down emitting a photon in unison with the electron falling down. Hmm? So let's read through this and then see if we really understand the mechanism, why we need inversion, because once you understand that point, you understand how a laser operates. So lasing principle. During spontaneous emission of photons, the quanta are emitted in a random direction at a random phase. So in other words, if I would go to this scenario here, the one on the left, I would have photons emitted randomly. I would have no lasing. It would correspond to the situation on the left there. In contrast, the photons emitted during stimulated emission are forced into phase by the radiation field. Underline that. If you understand that, you understand lasing. And remember the word, right? Stimulated emission. 
we have the S in there, we have the uh, E of lasing. And so in contrast, the photons emitted during stimulated emission or forced into phase, as you can see here. So this photon stimulates the emission of this electron and it forces this original photon and the photon being created by this one dropping down to go in phase. And you want that to happen as much as possible. Eventually, you want pretty much all of the photons in that tube to go in unison. And that's why you want them to go back and forth so it lases and gets more and more of the photons all at the same time with in phase going to that small pinhole exiting through the half mirror and always being reflected at the total mirror on the left side of the tube. So spontaneous emission of photons, the quanta are emitted randomly. In contrast, and so really underline that, the photons emitted during stimulated emission are forced into phase by the radiation field. When a number of these in-phase wave trains overlap each other, the resultant radiation field propagates in the one direction with a very stable amplitude. Can you connect this image now indeed with the idea that we need more population here? You do, right? Because otherwise, most of your photons are being consumed by doing this. You need to be in a situation where more of those are falling down so that the incoming photon can pair with them, stimulate the emission, and get photons to go in phase. And so, I don't know if it is sharp enough for all of you in the back here, but let's now go to the five phases uh, of lasing action. And again, we have the two mirrors here, right? And this one is a total mirror, and this one is a half mirror, so that light can exit on this side. So two conditions must be met in order to synchronize the stimulated atomic emission. First, there must be more atoms present in their higher excited states than in the lower energy levels. Understand that, right? That's the inversion. Yeah, so we need to be in this situation here so that the light that comes in can get more of these top ones to fall down than to promote electrons from E1 to E2. So before we start, we have no input yet. The lasing medium is at the ground state in number one. Now we start pumping energy in, and it can be electrical, chemical, nuclear, whatever, right? Optical. Uh, that promotes enough electrons to a higher state. That's number two. Then eventually, you have enough promoted to get that inversion. That's number three. So you get spontaneous emission together with the start of stimulated emission, because you will always have still a little bit of spontaneous emission. But what you want is, of course, the stimulated emission to take over, because at that point, you then start having the building up of the lasing effect. And by stage four, you got it. You got a strong beam of lasing light emerging from the half-mirrored side of the tube. So there must be an inversion, and you start having that in level three. This is necessary, otherwise the stimulated emission of quanta will be directly reabsorbed by the atoms which are present in lower energy states, right? You want more to emit than to absorb. The inverted condition does not prevail in nature. You know that, right? In a thermal condition, the lower energy levels will be more densely populated. And so you need some means of pumping the atoms, and that's the second condition you need. So any question on that? And the last slide kind of re-summarizes then how the lasing works. So you might, when you're preparing for your midterm or your final, just work yourself one more time through this five or six slides and make sure you understand how lasing comes about. There's another thing in, the, in this class that's kind of quite similar. I could ask how a plasma comes about and I could ask how a lasing system comes about. 
right? Uh, and, and don't try to memorize it. Try to get it in your head, just the physics of it, because there's no use in memorizing all these complicated uh, laser names, because it's much simpler. You can just see through all of them, because they all have this underlying phenomenon that drives it. So with that, I will only show you two more slides, and I will come back to those tomorrow. I want you to focus on understanding this picture where we use a traditional laser uh, to machine a metal, let's say. And you can see I've cut this metal here with a laser machine, a traditional laser, and you can see I have all kind of things. Uh, I have some metal debris that has spilled over. You can see that recast layer, we call it surface debris. We also have uh, the ejected molten material that causes actually shock waves through the material and then causes this heat affected zone. Remember HAZ. All right, so this is a long pulse laser beam. All kind of negative effects. You have cracks, you have this heat affected zone. This material here behaves really different than the material there. Despite that, laser machining is used a lot because, you know, you might not care too much or you can get rid of this material. Maybe you polish it off or you have a chemical that etches this away. Now let's compare this with a laser that pulses very fast. Look at this. This is traditional lasing. This is femtosecond laser. A beautiful straight cut. Perfect. Now, why is that? It is because in the case on the left, this ultra-fast laser here, believe it or not, there's no melt zone. You go from metal, solid, directly to the gas phase. You create basically plasma. And it is so fast that you have no shock wave, no heat zone that disturbs the material. So the difference between these two is almost day and night. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tomorrow going to explain in detail why you can do such nice machining with a fast laser compared to your traditional lasing. For today, that's it. So I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to finish this story up on the laser and talk very briefly about EB machining and plasma cutting, but these are not such important techniques yet. And then I will go over all of the materials you should really focus on for Thursday's midterm. Okay, thank you.